All right. Well, if you have your Bibles with you, please turn with me to Zechariah chapter 5. And as you're turning, be thinking about this. Have you ever wondered about how much control God has over the advancement of sin in this world? We see sin all around us. We see it advancing. There are liberal agendas everywhere. And these liberal agendas have their influence over admissions policies to universities, hiring practices for companies and organizations, and everything else. Have you ever wondered how much control God has over the advancement of sin? And secondly, have you ever wondered what God's faithfulness looks like when he acts? What does it actually look like when God keeps his word? What are all the mechanisms that are necessary for God to keep his word? This morning, we're going to be looking at Zechariah's last two visions, visions number seven and eight. And we're going to be answering those questions this morning from the text. How much control God really has over the advancement of sin and what it really looks like when God is faithful to what he said he would do. Uh, we got vision seven, the woman in the basket. And we're going to find out that God has full control over the extent of sin, and he has full control not only over its extent, but its destruction as well. We're also going to be looking at vision eight, the vision of the four chariots, and we'll see that God will utilize all of his resources once and for all to permanently conquer and subdue sin. So let's take a look at uh, our slide, which has the eight visions of Zechariah. And if we can look at those, once again, we're going to see what it looks like we have eight separate visions, and they go in pairs, and today we're going to be lacking at the last two. You can see that they're paired together. Vision number seven fits well with vision number two, and the last vision, vision number eight, pairs with vision number one. Let's take a look at the opening text of Zechariah chapter five. We're going to read verses five through eight. We're going to take a look at what God says about the woman in the basket. And as I read this, uh, picture in your mind a basket. And picture in your mind about how that basket is an effective container for what's inside the basket. Let's read. Then the angel who was speaking with me went out and said to me, lift up your eyes and see what is going forth. So I said, what is it? And he said, this is the ephah going forth. Again, he said, this is their appearance in all the land. And behold, a lead cover was lifted up. And this is a woman sitting inside the ephah. And he said, this is wickedness. And he threw her down into the middle of the ephah and threw the lead weight on its opening. So the angel instructs Zechariah to see what this is going forth. And the reason why he describes this as going forth is because going forth implies again, God's purpose. This is something we see throughout all of these visions. We have a man going forth. We have the woman going forth. We have storks going forth. Uh, that is accomplishing God's divine purpose. What this is telling us is that God has a divine purpose here, and the entities that are in that vision are going to accomplish that purpose. They are instruments in God's hands to accomplish his purpose. So at the beginning of chapter 6, uh, sorry, chapter 5, verse 6, Zechariah asks again, what is it? And the, the angel says, the ephah. And here the ephah going forth again is serving God's purpose. And shortly we'll, it'll become clear what that purpose is. But we have to understand what an ephah is. It's a basket. It's a basket that's about eight gallons in size. And when you put grain in a basket, uh, that grain meets a need within us. It stores the grain for the time that we need it. We take the grain out and we do what we need to with the grain. And we praise and give thanks to God for the giver of that, that grain. And all of that is good. That is right and that is good. But when you begin to have affections for that grain and you worship the grain itself rather than the giver of that grain, that is when you begin to see greed and materialism that are taking place. And that's what we have here in this vision. That's what God is getting at here in this vision. This is a symbolic of Israel's pursuit of things other than God himself. And we see that when we keep reading, and we'll get that out in verse 8. But in the next part of verse 6, the angel says to him, this is their appearance in all the land. And here the word appearance relates to the eye, your eyeball. 
And what this spe speaks to is that this is what the focus or the vision of the person really is. It's what their desire is. And what it is in the case of Israel is a desire to get more of what they already have. It's a bit of a play on words here when we're thinking about this basket. What Israel really is is a basket that wants to be filled with more and more and more of what the world has to offer. Before Israel went into exile in Babylon, their biggest problem was idolatry. And that aroused God's jealousy because God said to them clearly in Exodus 20, in the Ten Commandments, you shall have no other God before me. I am to be the object of your affection. I am to be the object of your devotion. That was their biggest problem before exile. But in Babylon, Israel got a front row seat to what was King Belshazzar and all that he was about. All of his lavish parties and his opulence, all of his extravagance, all of his lust, all his dirty things, all of his greed. And that took hold in Israel and it carried forward for centuries. So far that it was still at root in the heart of the Pharisees when they were on the earth in the time of Jesus' earthly ministry. Their biggest motivating factor was not piety and holiness before God, but it was material gain that they would gain from people following after them as their leaders. So that's what Israel's sin was. It was their material greed. And we need to be clear here that their greed was not in having the abundance. There was nothing wrong with God selectively choosing by his own divine providence to extend abundant blessing to a person. That is not where the greed is. The greed is not in having abundance, but the greed is in craving that abundance and the endless pursuit of that abundance. I was reminded of, of a slogan about 45 years ago. If you're old enough to remember the 1980s, you can remember MTV. It stood for Music Television. This was back in the days when they didn't have streaming music services and you didn't post things to the internet. Bands would record a music video and they would send it to a station and the station would play that music. And if you wanted to watch a music video, you would turn into the music TV channel and you'd watch that video. But their slogan, and, and this was the rage, this was the rage all over the high schools and the colleges in the 80s. And if you haven't heard of it, you just check with your grandparents, they can <laughs> tell you all about it. But uh, their slogan was, was very, very helpful here. The slogan was, too much is never enough. That was their slogan. You can't get enough of this music. But that is symbolic of what the ephah really represents. It's Israel's eye. They had a lust and a craving and a desire. And they had an appetite to be filled by the things of this world. But if we keep reading, we see the point of the vision is that God actually constrains the sin. Israel has this desire, but we see that God's hand is actually constraining them. And the angel is still speaking. We get to verse 7. Behold, a lead cover was lifted up. So there is a lead cover that is over this basket, and it is lifted up. And this is a woman sitting inside the ephah. Again, that's what the interpreting angel says to Zechariah. So the lead cover was lifted up, meaning it's normally over the basket. That's helping us understand. But then we see that inside the basket, there's a woman sitting inside the ephah. And the angel says, this is wickedness. And he threw her down into the middle of the ephah and threw the lead weight on its opening. So the angel says, the woman is wickedness. And this is not a commentary on women in general. It's something very, very specific here for this one woman. This woman represents wickedness. But the important thing to notice is that this woman is not free. She is sitting inside the ephah. She cannot extend her influence on her own. Her influence is limited. And that becomes clear at the end of verse 8 when you read that after she was thrown down into the middle of the ephah, the lead weight was thrown again over its opening. And so she's constrained. So God is saying at this time in human history, I am going to constrain the extent of sin. I'm going to constrain the extent to which Israel is craving and desiring more. I'm going to constrain the spread of it. So what God is showing here is that his sovereign purpose includes allowing the sin of materialism and other things and greed to exist, but to constrain its progress for now. 
And we ask ourselves, well, what does it matter to us if God constrains sin? Why, why should we be so concerned that God constrains sin? And the answer is because this assures us of God's authority over sin. And if God has authority over sin, then he also, we can have confidence that one day God will be able to destroy that sin. And we see that in the rest of the vision. We're going to see God's destruction of sin in verses 9 through 11. So let's read together. Zechariah then says, Then I lifted up my eyes and saw, and behold, two women were coming out with wind in their wings. And they had wings like the wings of a stork, and they lifted up the ephah between the earth and the heavens. And I said to the angel who was speaking with me, Where are they taking the ephah? Then he said to me to build a house for her in the land of Shinar. And when it is prepared, she will be set there on her own pedestal. So you have two women coming out. And this is different from the woman in the basket. You have two women coming out. And again, that represents God's purpose. These women are instruments accomplishing God's predetermined plan. And we notice that wind is in their wings. And the Hebrew word for wind is the same word for spirit. And so God's spirit is in their wings. That doesn't mean that these are created, or uh, sorry, redeemed creatures. They're not redeemed creatures. That's not what this is getting at. What this is getting at is that this shows us God's overarching purpose, and they are being used by God's purpose to accomplish his purpose. What we do know about these women becomes very clear when we see that they have wings like a stork. Leviticus chapter 11, you can write down verses 13 and 19 in Leviticus 11. This tells us something. Uh, The Lord is giving through Moses instructions to Israel about what is clean and what is not clean, what is detestable and what is not detestable. He says in Leviticus 11, 13, moreover, you shall detest among the birds. And then he's got a long list of things that are detestable. And by the time you get to verse 19, you read, and the stork. So a Jew knew that a stork was detestable. So the angel has Zechariah's attention. They represent something sinful and detestable, so it can't be good. But that really is only the beginning, and you see what is is fully taking place when you read verse 11. What they're doing is they are going to build a house for her in the land of Shinar. And this house is not a dwelling place. It's not really a dwelling place. What it really is, is a place of worship. It's a place of worship. They were taking the sin of materialism to a place where it will be esteemed. And we know that this is not good because of the reference to Shinar. Turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 11. We'll just remind ourselves briefly of what's taking place there. We're going to read verse 4. We'll also look at verse 2, and then we'll move on from there. The setting here is the plains of Shinar. And we know what this is. This is a gathering of humanity after the flood. Man is gathered together. We know that the flood didn't cure the heart problem that man had. After the flood, God looked out and he saw that the heart of man is evil. He knows that. Look at what man says in verse 4 of Genesis 11. Come, let us build for ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach into the heavens and let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered over the face of the whole earth. All of this took place in verse 2 on the plain of Shinar. This is the first place after the flood where man collectively gathered together and expressed his sin in rebellion against God. He aspired to make a name for himself, and this was so offensive to God that God confounded their efforts by introducing language into this world. Multiple languages that thwarted man in his desire and his efforts to make a name for himself. So we see the true nature of this when we see that the woman in the basket in verse 11, back in our passage, she will be set there on her own pedestal. And a pedestal was something that established a position and a place for something, a high place, a place of esteem. But it's also a place that that has permanence. So you've got this this desire to put this, this sin of opulence, this sin of greed and materialism on a place of high esteem permanently. And it's for the purpose of worship. So they're directly opposing God. And we ask ourselves, so if if this section is all about God's judgment, where does God's judgment come into view here? And we see that 
in the language that's used in verse 9 in our passage. They lifted up the ephah between the earth and heaven. The ephah is on the ground, and the two women, filled with the Spirit, lift up that ephah between the earth and heaven. Three times in your Old Testament that phrase is used between earth and heaven, and every single time judgment is in view. It's in view here, but it's also in view in 1 Chronicles chapter 21. David numbered Israel. He knew he was not to number Israel, but he did, and God gave David three choices. How do you want me to discipline you for this? And David chose the shortest duration of those disciplines, and it was an angel carrying out God's vengeance for three days. And that angel was positioned between earth and heaven as he executed God's judgment in the land of Israel. Many thousands of people died. That's First Chronicles 21, 16. The third reference where this takes place is in Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 8. God transports Ezekiel and he gives him a position to see what he is going to do in his judgment of Israel. And while he does that, he gives Ezekiel a position between earth and heaven. And then in our New Testament, that is where Christ is suspended on a cross. He is suspended between earth and heaven, representing sinful man before a holy God. So judgment is in view here. Second way we know this is all about judgment is because of Shinar. This is the Tower of Babel. It's God's judgment on those people. Again, it's their first exhibition of their own sin where God put that sin to rest in Babylon or in uh, Shinar. But Shinar is named Babel, verse 9 of Genesis 11. Therefore, its name was called Babel because there Yahweh confused the language of the whole earth. It is named Babel in the land of Shinar. Let's jump ahead to Revelation chapter 18. I'm going to read verses 9 through 11, and we'll see judgment clearly, clearly in view here. This is describing the end of Babylon. This is describing the end of this system of world commerce and opulence and affluence. Verse 9, the kings of the earth committed sexual immorality, and they lived sensuously with Babylon. They will cry and lament over her when they see the smoke of her burning, standing at a distance because of the fear of her torment, saying, woe, woe, the great city Babylon, the strong city, for in one hour your judgment has come. And all the merchants of the earth cry and mourn over her because no one buys their cargo anymore. So the kings of the earth committed sexual immorality with Babylon. They engaged in all of the sin and the dirtiness and the impurity of Babylon. Verse 18 begins a list of 28 different expressions of that sin, all of which are aiming at opulence and affluence and more and more and more. And none of it was pleasing to the Lord. That was all done against Babylon, which is in Shinar. So the transporting of the basket to Shinar symbolizes the growing extent of greed and the extent of materialism in this world. So we can see that God is going to constrain sin, but we can see also that God is going to judge that sin. There is no doubt that God will judge it. There's a point of application for us, and that application for us has to do with our own discernment. Uh, The Lord is kind and he is merciful and he extends blessing to us from the fruit of our own work and our own labor. So the point of application for us is, are we able to discern the difference between, on the one hand, humble acceptance of what God gives us, and on the other hand, craving for more of what God gives us? Do we humbly accept what God bestows on us as the fruit of our labor, or do we just see that as occasion to crave more and more of that same thing? Do I find my true joy in the giver of that gift as we should? Or do I find my joy in the gift itself? So Israel is sitting here. They're listening to this judgment from Zechariah. And they must be thinking to themselves, there is a final showdown coming here between God and wickedness. But Israel must be asking themselves, what is God going to do with all of this sin that is in the world? all of this sin that we have embraced. 
And God's answer is very, very clear. God's answer is, I will destroy it. And that's what our last vision really is all about. Vision number eight, the four chariots. So we've seen seven different visions so far, and they've been fantastic visions. God has been putting on display different aspects of the millennial kingdom, how it is going to come, how we will notice this, who is coming, what will take place on this earth, what will God do to bring it all about. These are God's promises. These are God's plans. These are God's purposes. But we notice something in all of these seven uh, visions, and that is that there is not a lot of action. This last vision shows that heaven is not dormant. It's not just about talk. It's not just about promises. It shows us that God has actually activated his angels. He has already started to do what he said he would do. So what we're going to do here is we are going to look at the four chariots. And first, we're going to look at their readiness. Verses 1 to 3 of chapter 6. As we read this, just think back a little bit, if you can, to vision number 1, where you had the man who was on a horse, and he was standing in the ravine, amongst the myrtle trees. And look for some similarities, but also look for some differences between this vision and the first vision. Zechariah says, again, then I lifted up my eyes and I saw and behold, four chariots were coming forth from between the two mountains and the mountains were bronze mountains. With the first chariot were red horses, the second chariot black horses, the third chariot white, and the fourth chariot dappled horses, all of them mighty. Now, a chariot has one use, and that use is war. A chariot is used to actually accomplish something. It's much more powerful than a horse by itself. When you look at a chariot, you're dealing with more weaponry, you're dealing with more resource, you're dealing with more mass, and it's much more effective for destruction. But we'll notice that there are four chariots here. And when we see the number four, and you see the number four in discussions about the end times particularly, what you want to be thinking about here is all of the ends of the earth. Geographical completeness. Turn your Bibles to Revelation chapter 7, verse 1. John is writing, and you're going to see a picture of this. You're going to see the number four repeated three times. Revelation 7, 1. John has seen many things. Starting in chapter 6, he has seen several different judgments. In Revelation chapter 7, verse 1, John writes, After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth. There's our information. Holding back the four winds of the earth. So the four corners of the earth there are helping us understand that these these angels are distributed across the world. Their influence is across the entire world. All of the world is covered by their influence. What this is telling us here with these chariots, as you have four chariots, is that God is about to go everywhere. He's about to go everywhere in keeping his promise. And in keeping God's promise, there is more than meets the eye. We can only see the external need for the God to act and the result of God's action. But so often, we're a little bit unaware of all that is involved in God actually answering that prayer. God is going to exercise his control over the whole world in order to keep his promises to Israel. God is saying, I am going to mobilize heaven. I am going to actually enlist the services of every asset I have in heaven to make sure that all of my promises to you come to pass. And the reason, again, why we have these chariots is because they go to war. And they're, we see that they're coming forth here in this vision. They're actually coming forth just like a lot of the other things that are coming forth. And again, that tells us that God has a purpose here. And their job is actually to execute a mission. But we begin to understand more about the mission when we look at where they are coming from. They're coming from between two mountains. And it's not just two mountains. It is two bronze mountains. And bronze mountains are symbols of strength and conquest and holiness and righteousness and goodness. Let me just mention a couple of passages that help us understand this. Revelation chapter 1, when John sees Jesus and he falls down on his face, there's a description of Jesus. His feet are like burnished bronze. That means that Jesus is going to progress. There is nothing that can impede his step. 
There is nothing that can damage or hurt or harm his feet. His progress is unstoppable. And Ezekiel in chapter 1, verse 27, when he sees this vision and he's got these four wheels and got lots of other things that he sees, he sees Messiah Jesus. And what he sees about Messiah Jesus from the waist down is glowing bronze, glowing metal. So this idea of bronze communicates not only strength and impenetrability, but it includes a holiness and a righteousness as well. Let me read chapter 14, verses 3 and 4 of Zechariah. We're going to get there eventually. We'll get there and we'll actually read what happens when Jesus does come. Zechariah writes, we're going to start actually in verse 1. Then Yahweh will go forth and fight against those nations as the day when he fights on a day of battle. And in that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which is in front of Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives will be split in its middle from east to west by a very large valley so that half of the mountain will move north and the other half will move toward the south. So this is the setting here is at the onset of the Battle of Armageddon. And the Mount of Olives will be split in half. Jesus will be standing with one foot on one side of, of the Mount of Olives and one foot on the other. And this is the worst day in Israel's history. This is the worst day in all of their history since God made them a nation with Abraham. This is a day when they are on the verge of and on the brink of annihilation from all of the nations of the world gathering against them. And what happens? Jesus appears with his feet on these two mountains. So what God is saying here in this vision is that I will show you that there is victory that is coming from these mountains. We have these chariots that are coming from there. Jesus will be there to save the Jews and their opponents will be defeated there. God is saying, you can guarantee, you can know, you can count on the fact that I will be victorious there. And so towards that end, God enlists the, the help of four of these chariots and their colors are really significant. You can notice in verse two that you have red horses that are pulling these chariots. There are also black horses and dappled horses and white horses. Throughout Zechariah, red represents war. There will be war. God is going to execute war. He's going to be engaged in war. He is going to destroy greed and excess and every other sin that's in the world. Black, when we read here and when we read in Revelation and other places, represents famine. There is an absence of supply and commerce. And these dappled horses are a mottled horse. Sometimes they're gray in color as well. And that represents life or death rather, and God is going to make war against life itself. And then you have white horses that represent victory. The victor always rides a white horse. God is saying, I'm going to be victorious in all of my war on greed and excess, in all of my war on commerce, that I'm going to use famine against that, in all of my war on life itself. I will be victorious in all of those things. He will defeat all that needs to be defeated in order for him to keep his promises. And we see at the end of verse 3 that all of these are mighty. So God has endowed these creatures with a strength and a power that is superior to that which is in the world. And they need a superior strength and they need a superior power because their task is to defeat the world. So God is faithful. There is much more to God's faithfulness sometimes than what we can comprehend. God enlists massive, massive resources to accomplish everything that he intends to do. We have a, a tendency to see the final result, but God is giving us a picture here of what happens in the, behind the scenes when he actually accomplishes what he sets out to do. So then we're going to take a look at verses 4 through 8, and we are going to see the work of these horses. So Zechariah says, Then I answered and I said to the angel who was speaking with me, what are these, my Lord? <clears throat> and the angel answered and said to me, These are the four spirits of heaven going forth after standing before the Lord of all the earth. One of which the black horses are going forth to the north country, and the white ones go after them. And the dappled ones go forth to the south country. Now the mighty ones went out. They sought to go patrol the earth. And he said, Go patrol the earth. So they patrolled the earth. 
Then he cried out to me and spoke to me saying, see, those who are going to the land of the north have caused my spirit to have rest in the land of the north. So we ask ourselves, what is the significance of these? What is the significance of these? They are going to do everything that God has said he would do in Zechariah, in visions number one through seven. Again, you have these four spirits of the wind in verse five. Four spirits of heaven. And again, the idea here with the word spirit is, is wind. And the idea here is that this is God's spirit. This is God's directive. This is God's power that is coming to into play. But we see that this, this wind or these spirits have had an adverse effect in the past. In vision number three, we had the four winds that actually scattered Israel to the nations in chapter two, verse eight. So these spirits had scattered Israel. And in vision seven, the four winds were carrying the ephah to Shinar. So it was progressing the extent of sin and the worship of sin but here you have these four winds and they are undoing everything that was done in those visions. They are going to restore Israel to the promised land and they are going to defeat the sin that was headquartered in Babylon. And we know this from verse five, the four spirits are going forth after standing before the Lord of all the earth. So they're standing, they're standing at attention. They're standing ready for instructions. They're standing ready to be dispatched. And they're standing ready to be dispatched by the Lord of all of the earth. And this is the name that's given for Christ, but it's given for Christ in a particular context in scripture. When you read the Lord of the earth, almost every single time it refers to Christ as he is establishing his millennial kingdom. So these, these are ready. They're ready to be dispatched and they're ready to be sent out to do the bid of the Lord of all of the earth, Messiah Jesus. And so we see in verse six that the chariots with the black horses are going to the north country. Now the north was the direction from which invading armies and invading countries would come. They didn't come from the west because the Mediterranean Sea was over there and they didn't come from the east because there was a large desert on that side. They came from the north. Many nations did that. Babylon did that, Assyria did that. Later, the Greeks would do that and the Romans would do that. This was the way to get to Israel if you wanted to attack Israel was from the north. And this is a picture of God's judgment of those nations. And it was a picture that that judgment will be successful because you keep reading in verse six, the white ones go after them. The one that symbolizes victory after the black ones go and accomplish that war. God is saying, my judgment will be severe. It will be certain it will be severe. Then we notice that the dappled ones, they go to the South country. And we think of our, in our minds, we have a picture of Egypt and Israel where they are relative to one another. Egypt is South of Israel. And they were always opposed to Israel. There were short periods where there were alliances that were made, but in general, the characteristic of Egypt was that they were opposed to Israel from the beginning. So how God has judgment on all the nations that attacked Israel from the north. He has judgment from, on Egypt from the south. God is saying, I will eliminate every enemy that rises up against you. And that will be the case um, in the very end of the time. When you read your Bible in, in Revelation, it's the nations that are gathered together around surrounding Jerusalem. God is saying, every single one of them, I will be successful against them. But you'll notice there's no mention of the red horses. You've got the black ones going north and the white ones following after them and the dappled horses going to the south to take care of Egypt. But you don't have the red ones anywhere. That's because the red ones are staying still. They're staying right where they are, meaning there is gonna be war in the land of Israel. The war is actually gonna take place there amongst all the people in Israel. Many foes will be defeated in the promised land. So when we read verse seven, the mighty ones went out and they sought to go patrol the earth. And he said, go patrol the earth. So they patrolled the earth. Now this patrol is not a going out and a looking and a sitting and an observing and a reconnaissance where you just look. This is a different kind of activity here. The activity here is to assess the situation and then execute your command on that situation. 
And so Zechariah sees the departure of these chariots to accomplish God's perfect judgment on the world. And verse 8 is where we see the summation of all of this. Yahweh himself cries out to Zechariah, and he spoke to Zechariah, and he says, See, those who are going to the land of the north have caused my spirit to have rest in the land of the north. To cry out here is God is summoning Zechariah to himself. He's saying, you need to hear this. I need your attention in this. You've got to get this. And I am eager to share with you how this is going to turn out. I'm eager to share with you what is going to take place in Babylon. Divine judgment is going to take place there. The chariots with black horses will be so dominant in their task that there will be no more work for me to do. And there will be a true rest here. This tells us that all that God has promised to do in all these visions has come to pass. You've got the situation where there is true rest. God's spirit is having true rest. He's not having to accomplish any other thing because all of God's opponents are defeated. And Messiah Jesus will be ruling over the earth in his millennial kingdom. And so you think back to where we started in chapter 1. You think back to where, what God says to this small band of 42,000 people. He says, return to me. These people had been despairing for 16 years because they started rebuilding the temple. They laid the foundation. And then the foundation laid bare for 16 years because of some local opposition to them. And they had become a byword again. Your God can't do anything. Your temple isn't even being built. You've got an empty bare slab there waiting for us. That's where Israel was when, when all of this starts. And you look at where we are now at the end of this. God is resting in his millennial kingdom and all of his work is done. That's really, really encouraging. And you have this long process that is going to take place. It takes place over thousands and thousands of years. But God is faithful. He remembers his covenant and he will accomplish that. There's one point of reference for us in this and one point of application that we need to think carefully about. And that has to do with our prayer life. We know that, that God asks us to pray and pray in asking. If we ever lack anything, we are to ask. God tells us, ask. And when we ask, we should ask with confidence that God will do exactly what he has intended to do. So asking is, is really, really good for us. But when we pray, let's be mindful that who we are praying to and what is involved in the answering of that prayer. Again, sometimes the, the prayer request itself, we can focus on the desired outcome, but so often God is at work in the process of answering that prayer according to his needs. And he is enlisting all of his resources in accomplishing his purposes for us. So when we pray, let's be mindful of God's extravagant resources and also be mindful of how it is that God must use all of those resources to actually answer the prayer requests that we bring before him. So God's spirit is at rest. All of this is really great. Zechariah has received eight visions and every single one of them is fantastic. Every single one of them is out of this world. And this should arouse the expectations of every single Jew this should bring confidence to every Jew who actually reads their Bible. This is what God will do to my people and for my people. God will actually be faithful to his word. He will actually remember his covenant. And this should also arouse the expectation of the Gentile as well. But it's easy to become overtaken by that expectation. We develop theologies around our expectation of the end times. We study all the Bible verses that relate to that. We memorize the right verses so we can get our, our eschatology right. But God's purpose in all of this is to produce in us a holy obedience through the knowledge of what we know is coming. And that's what we're going to see in the next section. This is sort of the, the so what conclusion of all of these visions before Zechariah begins writing the rest of this book. And what we need to understand here is that there is a picture of a king. There is a character of a king. And there is a response to the king. So let's look at the picture of the king in verses 9 through 11. The word of Yahweh came to me saying, Take an offering from the exiles, from Heldai, Tobijah, and Jediah, and you come the same day and come into the house of Josiah, the son of Zephaniah, where they have come from Babylon. And take silver and gold 
make an ornate crown and set it on the head of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. So the word of Yahweh comes to Zechariah. The visions are over. This is still divine revelation, though. And God mentions three guys, Heldai, Tobijah, and Jediah. And understanding something about these men would be very, very helpful as we try to understand what is taking place in these verses. At the beginning of verse 10, we see that God says, take an offering from the exiles. And then he lists their names. So these were men who were exiled and they came back. They were among the group that returned with Zechariah. And at the end, you see that they've come back from Babylon. So they came back, but we know a lot about the people who came back. These are the people who are ready to leave behind all of the worldliness of Babylon. They were ready to go back and rebuild the temple and live a hard life. And these three men were those three men. They were in that group. But we also know these men were probably priests because Zechariah was to take them to the house of Josiah, the son of Zephaniah. You can just write down this passage, 2 Kings 25, 18. Zephaniah was a priest. So Josiah, his son, was also in the priestly line. So Zechariah is taking three men to the house of a priest. So these men are very likely priests themselves. So they're probably pretty godly men. Godly men who left Babylon, they're ready to come back. But notice they brought an offering. And this offering was of gold and silver. Another evidence that they're godly men is that they didn't squander it. They still have it. I want us to turn in our Bibles to Ezra chapter 7 real quick. We're going to look at verses 15 and 17. What is taking place here is the king in Babylon is giving instructions to Israel as they return. He's making provision for them. There's a big long list of materials. We read in verse 15, bring the silver and the gold. In verse 17, buy bulls, rams, lambs, offer them on the altar. So provision is given to the people of Israel by Gentiles so that they will be able to purchase the animals that are necessary for the sacrifice. Verse 18, Whatever seems good to you and to your brothers to do with the rest of the silver and the gold, you may do according to the will of your God. This is a Gentile speaking. God is at work here. Artaxerxes was the king at the time. He gave them an abundance of gold. And these men are ready to use that gold according to God's plan. And we see what that plan is in verse 11 of chapter 6. And the instruction is, take the silver and gold and make an ornate crown and set it on the head of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. So Zechariah himself is to make this crown. It's a unique crown because it is made of two materials. It's made of silver and gold. And it's ornate. It's ornate even with reference to other crowns. So it's a separate crown. It is a unique crown, more ornate than most. And it's made of two materials. And Zechariah is to set it on the head of Joshua, the high priest. That simply wasn't done in Israel, putting a crown on the head of the high priest. We know from Exodus 30 that God said that Aaron shall burn fragrant incense on the altar every morning. So the priestly line of Aaron, their task was to burn incense before God and keep it going every day. Their task was not to rule. God had two offices for the nation of Israel, and they were clearly distinct for one another. But God made it very clear here that he was making a distinction to Israel in the role between the priest and the king. But God wasn't asserting anything about Joshua himself here. He wasn't saying a man, Joshua, is going to become priest and king. Rather, instead, he's pointing to the day when Israel will worship the one who will be both priest and king. So now we're going to look at the characteristic of that king, and we're going to see that in verses 12 and 13. When you say to him, yes, says Yahweh of hosts, behold, a man whose name is Branch, and he will branch out from where he is, and he will build the temple of Yahweh. Indeed, it is he who will build the temple of Yahweh, and he will bear the splendor and sit and rule on his throne. Thus, he will be a priest on his throne, and the council of peace will be between the two offices. 
So we're going to see what we can glean from this passage about this man. We can glean that he will be Messiah. God is bringing forth a man whose name is Branch. We see that in verse 12. That's the title for Messiah. In Hebrew, the Hebrews talked about Messiah. One of the words they used was Branch. So this is not a role that could be fulfilled by any mere man. Only the branch will conquer. Isaiah 4, 2. In that day, the branch of Yahweh will be the beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth will be the pride and the honor of those people of Israel. He is the one who is going to conquer. But not only is he going to be the Messiah, he's going to be the Savior because he's humble. The Savior, he's going to have branch-like origins in what he does. We think of the, the branch-like origins of Christ, the humility of Christ in his time leading up to the cross. Isaiah 53, 2, it's a, a passage we're familiar with. He grew up before him. Christ himself, Messiah Jesus, grew up before the Father like a tender shoot, no stately ground. So he's humble. He's humble enough to give his life to save. So he's a Messiah and he's a Savior, but he's also faithful. If you look at verse 13, Indeed, it is he who will build the temple of Yahweh. Israel had built Solomon's temple centuries before. David collected all the materials. Israel finished, uh, Solomon finished the work. He actually built it. Israel was building the new temple, the replacement temple under Zerubbabel, small as it was, but Christ himself will build the millennial kingdom, the millennial temple. He's faithful to the task. God is saying there must be a temple where my presence will dwell. So this man is a Messiah, he's a savior, he's faithful, but he's also king. Verse 13, he who will bear the splendor and sit and rule on his throne. Here's where we see Jesus coming into view here. He's all of these things. He's the savior, he's the Messiah, he's the king. He's not just coming to conquer, he's coming to rule over what rightly belongs to him. But he's also a priest because he will be a priest on his throne. In verse 13, so that's the culmination of all of his priestly duties. So in all of those things, we see Jesus. In verse 13, we see the council of peace will be between the two offices. No longer will you have one man serving as priest and one man serving as king and, and trying to, to manage some sort of progress for the nation of Israel. You don't have that. You won't have a priest representing the people to God and a king representing God to the people. Instead, you'll have one man performing both roles. So that's the characteristic of Christ when he comes. He's going to be a savior. He's going to be a Messiah. He is going to be faithful. He is going to be king. He's going to rule in all of these things. God is giving a very, very clear picture of who this person is. And so the last two verses that we're going to look at today help us understand what our response must be to this king. And this is where the rubber meets the road for every faithful saint, whether they are Old Testament or church age saint. Now the crown will become a memorial in the temple of Yahweh to Helem, Tobijah, Jediah, and Hen, the son of Zephaniah. And those who are far off will come and build the temple of Yahweh. Then you will know that Yahweh of hosts has sent me to you, and it will happen only if you utterly listen to the voice of Yahweh, your God. So we remember that the crown was made by Zechariah, but the materials were provided and brought by the four men. These are the four men that are listed here in verse 14. You notice that two names are the same and two names are different from what you see earlier in the passage. It's referring to the same four guys. Uh, it's probably best to see these, these two men here. Um, Helem is probably Heldai and Hen, which is the, the Hebrew word for grace is probably speaking of Josiah. These are the same guys. But the crown would serve as a memorial or a reminder to Israel. And it's a reminder of the kind of character that's to be present in God's people, obedient and pure. In verse 12, we understand that the branch would build God's house. But what we see here is the details of that. And that is that Messiah himself will oversee the construction and he will utilize people, faithful saints to do that. In verse 15, those who are far off will come and build the temple of Yahweh. The obedience of future Israel will be there to build the millennial kingdom and the millennial temple. And that should serve as an encouragement and compel the Jew of Zechariah's day to build Zerubbabel's temple. But it will also be built by Gentiles, Gentiles who are faithful and true. 
Chapter 2, verse 11, many nations will join themselves to Yahweh in that day and will become my people. This will be the great uniting of the Jew and the Gentile. They will work together on the temple, the very same temple that they will worship in. They will build it. Look at the end of verse 15, and this is what our takeaway is for us today. Then you will, this will all happen if you utterly listen to the voice of Yahweh your God. It's tempting to think that all of these promises should arouse the expectation again of the Jew, and they should, but these promises only come to pass for those who utterly listen. And the idea here is complete devotion. Think about Hebrews chapter 12, where the author writes, you have not yet shed blood in your striving against sin. The idea here is that we are willing to do anything to obey. To utterly listen is to apply yourself with everything in you with the intent to obey. And this is such an encouragement to the Christian today because the same grace that saves us is the grace that enables us to walk in holiness of life under the lordship of our Messiah as we expect and await his return. Let's pray. Father God in heaven, I thank you for your grace and your kindness. I thank you for your goodness to us, to give us your word, to lay out for us your purpose and your plan for us as to how it is that you will bring this age to an end and how you will bring the next age into being. I pray for us, Lord, that you would grant us your grace to anticipate your son and that anticipation of him would grant us, uh, Lord God, your grace to be holy and faithful to you as we do that. I pray for us as a church that you would give us the ability to live that out well with one another, that you would use us to encourage one another, you would use us to exhort one another, and I pray it in Christ's name. Amen.